Now in 2 Peter chapter 1 here, the, the portion of Scripture I want to focus on more tonight is kind of the first you know, 10, 12 verses that we read there. And I just want to point out just by saying, you know, the, the epistle, the second epistle of Peter starts off, he's writing to people who are saved. He's writing to believers. We get that from verse number one. The Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained, to them that have obtained. So this is who he's writing to. They have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That's who the, the epistle is addressed to. It's addressed to believers, people who have the like faith, right? And then he goes on to explain these things, and I'm going to go into each one of these individually a lot more in depth. He says in verse um, 5, And beside all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and the virtue knowledge. And he kind of goes into all these different attributes that we need to add to our faith. But what's really interesting here is he says in verse number 9, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. And what I'm going to be preaching about tonight is blind Christians. It is possible to, to be a Christian according to what we're going to read, what we just read here, to have faith, to believe on Jesus Christ, but to just be blinded. You know, this world has blinded you, but the way that, that we're specifically looking at in Scripture tonight is all of these different attributes. He's saying you need to have all of these because if you don't have these things, he says you're blind. And he's talking about people here, it says, that have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. You know, people who got saved. And this is another great verse that just teaches eternal security. We were just talking to a, to a man today that, that believes in a, in a works-based salvation. Basically, they believe that, that you can lose your salvation. If you start backsliding, if you get into sin, then nope, you're not saved anymore. You've got to get right with God. You've got to repent. You've got to do whatever in order to get back in good graces with God. And then you could have your eternal life back again or something. I mean, it's, it's a bizarre doctrine, but it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't hold any water. But here we can see it is possible for a believer... For someone who had faith to even get to the point because they've just, they're just they just so blinded because they don't have any of these attributes that they even just forget that they were once purged from, you know, purged from their old sins. I mean, that's what the Bible's saying right here. We don't want to be blind Christians where you cannot see afar off. We want to be able to see things ahead of us. We want to know what path we need to take and, and to be able to, to avoid any problems and pitfalls that come from not being able to see. We want to be able to see in front of us. So we're gonna, what I'm going to do tonight is we're going to analyze and just kind of dig into all of these attributes. So if you have any shortcomings, any failings where, you know what, I don't really have this, we can work on that. And we're going we're to really look in depth because these are all important. I mean, I don't want to be a blind Christian. Hopefully you don't want to be a blind Christian. So let's look at these. Because the other thing he says, if you have these things, look at verse number 8. He says, for if these things be in you and abound. I mean, if you have all these qualities and these attributes and they're abounding and you're doing really well with this, it says, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you can get these things to abound in your life, you will not be unfruitful. There's a lot of Christians who say, well, I've never, I've never led anyone to the Lord before. I've never been able to share the gospel and be able to lead someone to Christ. That's because you're lacking in one of these areas. Because if these are in you and abound, he says, you will, you will, they will make you that you are not barren nor unfruitful. And what is unfruitful? I mean, you're not producing any fruit. You're barren. You're, you're not producing anything for God. He says, if you, if you have these things and they abound, that'll make sure that you won't be unfruitful. So we want to make sure that these attributes are abounding. Yes, let's look at the first one. As I mentioned earlier, and, and you know, I just before we even get into the first one, I want to make one more point. He's making a serious point about these attributes. Look at verse number 12. He says, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. He's saying, Look, I don't want to be negligent. I'm going to make sure that you know these things. Even though you know them, I'm going to just hit it again. 
and hammer this home. And this is something that needs to be brought up repeatedly. Because someone might say, hey, Pastor Bersons, you've already preached on this list before. And I have. It's been about one or two years. I don't remember exactly how long it's been. But Peter thought it was really important. He says, look, even though you already know these things, we need to revisit this again. We need to make sure that we have all of these things in our life. And we're going to dig in real deep tonight. So let's look at the, uh, and then he says in verse 13, yeah, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle, meaning his body, as long as I'm alive, as long as I'm still here on earth. To stir you up by putting you in remembrance. He says, I'm going to try to stir you up. We're going to look at these things so hopefully you can get stirred up and be brought in. And none of these things are, are very uh, hard concepts to grasp, right? All these attributes are real simple. But the point is getting you stirred up to say, yeah, you know what? I need to work on this or I need to work on that because I don't want to be blind. So what's the first one? He says, he says add to your faith. I mean, hopefully everyone here is a believer in Jesus Christ. Because that's the starting point, right? That is the base level. Hey, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, so what do I need to do? Well, he says, add to that faith virtue. What is virtue? Virtue is basically, virtue is like goodness or doing good, like going out and being able to just do uh, uh, virtuous things. You think, the thing that comes to my mind is in Proverbs 31, you have the, the scripture regarding the virtuous woman. Right? And, and Proverbs 31 goes through all of this list and these attributes and these qualities that a woman has that is very virtuous. And, and just off the top of my head, some of the things that are in there, you know, basically it's, it's showing a very hardworking woman, someone who cares about her family, someone who's staying up late, getting up early, and just doing a lot of really good work and helping out her whole family and, and making sure that everything is taken care of. She was virtuous. She was doing what was good. So when we have our faith, he's saying the first thing I'd add, add virtue. And, and virtue isn't, it's not just, we're going to get into knowledge, but it's not just knowing. It's doing. You know, being virtuous is something that you actually are, are doing. We ought to be adding works to our faith. Not that we believe that works save us by any means, but once you have the faith, hey, start doing the work for God. Start being virtuous and doing what's right. Amen. The next thing he says, after you have your faith, you add virtue to that. He says, and to virtue, knowledge. So, and these two go, and you'll notice a lot of these will go kind of hand in hand. You're going to need one in order to have the other, in order to have the other, in order to even know what's good and what to do, what's right. Well, you need to have knowledge, right? You can't just completely blindly be doing good stuff without knowing what's right and wrong. And the only way you're going to know what's right and wrong is to have knowledge from Scripture. The Bible says in Proverbs 1, uh, turn if you would to Isaiah chapter 5. I've got a bunch of, of references here. Um, I, most of them I'll probably just read for you. But in Proverbs 1, the Bible says in verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So if you don't have knowledge, not only are you going to be blind as a Christian, but you're going to be a fool. The Bible says fools despise wisdom and instruction. We need to, the very first thing we need to get in your pursuit of knowledge, if you want to gain knowledge, the very first step is fearing God. Why? Well, if you fear God, you're going to be respecting the thing that he says. You fear God, you're going to, you're going to be able to look to his, to his words and say, hey, I know God's capable of doing anything. I'm going to have a, a proper fear of God. And because I fear God, I'm going to be really making sure that I'm paying attention to everything that he says. Now, parents can kind of get a good grasp of, of this concept. A lot of people don't like that. They'll say, oh, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound very godly. But anyone who's had little children knows it's important that your child has a proper fear of you. Now, let me just explain this and, 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 and come full out with it because it's not a bad thing. The world might make you think that, oh man, that's terrible. How could you say your, your child should fear you? I don't mean that they should fear me killing them, right? They, they shouldn't fear me doing, you know, just some extreme, bizarre type of abuse or something. That's not the type of fear I'm talking about. 
but they should fear receiving a correction. They should be able to fear enough to say, I know that if I do thus and so, if I, if I break dad's rules, there's going to be consequences for it. And I don't want those consequences because, you know, I, I'm afraid of that. I don't want that to happen. That's the type of fear that we ought to have. Now, the reason why I bring up children is because if you're born again, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are God's child. And the Bible tells us that God chastens every son whom he receiveth. What son is he that God doesn't chasten, that he doesn't discipline? It says if you, if you are without discipline, you're a bastard and not a son. God is going to discipline all of us. And we need to fear that. We ought, we ought to be real careful and not just flippant about the things that we do and just, oh, well, whatever, you know, I've got Christ, so I'm saved. I can just do whatever I want. No. Yes, you're saved, but, but, but no, you don't. That's not fearing God. And that's the beginning of knowledge, is having that proper fear of God. And we don't want to be blind, right? That's the whole point. We don't want to be blind. We want to know what we can do so we can be fruitful, so we can do what's right. Hey, and we don't want to be blind. We want to be able to see afar off. We need to get knowledge. Knowledge will help you with your virtue. Did I have you turn to Isaiah? Where did I have you turn? Isaiah 5? Isaiah 5, look at verse number 13. The Bible reads, Wherefore my people are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multi multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoices shall descend into it. So here he's, he's, he's explaining in Isaiah 5 that, my people are gone into captivity. They're being, they, they've been taken over by a foreign country and have gone into captivity. They've been taken prisoner because they have no knowledge. And I fear for this country because I see a lot of people that have no knowledge that are just setting themselves up to go into captivity. It, we were talking about this briefly out soul winning today. It boggles my mind that we live in a country today where there is like a large number of people supporting socialism of someone who just comes right out and just says, yes, I'm a socialist. I believe that we should just socialize all of these different things, education, healthcare, and all this other stuff. When <laughs> do you not read history? Do you not look at other, I mean, do you not see what this leads to? It's just no knowledge whatsoever. And there's so, I'm not going to get off on a whole socialism rant. I could very easily, it, but it, it's, it's frustrating because all that's going to do is bring you into bondage. Mm -hmm. Do you know who was socialist? Hitler and the Nazi Germany. And a lot of people don't even realize that. People are touting, oh, socialism, socialism. Do you know what Nazi stands for? It's national socialism. You say, oh, but I'm democratic socialism. Oh, yeah, big difference. And you could argue with me over the little details, but the overall philosophy is the same. Yep. It's the socialism. And that is a big problem. And, and people, the kids these days don't even know that. They don't even know what Nazi means. It just becomes this, this term that you throw to anything you don't like. You notice that? I mean, that's in the political process. Anytime someone says something that offends you, oh, you Nazi, oh, you're like Hitler. You know, just thrown out, just flippantly thrown out there. And it shouldn't be. I mean, that was a, that's, a serious, that's a big deal. And we need to know what the, what the root causes of that are. It came from a people desperate for change in Germany. And a leader rose up and just said, hey, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna make Germany great again. Mm -hmm. yep. That was his slogan. Mm -hmm. We're going to make Germany great. How are we going to do that? Well, we need to get rid of these people over here. We need to get rid of these people over here. And we need to socialize things. And we're going to build up. You know, our country is going to train up our youth. Right? The state is going to take care of that. The state is going to educate. The state is going to do it. And basically, the state has become the God. And socialism is just one step prior to communism. But we live in a world today of people just without knowledge. Some people are very well-intentioned and they have this ideology, but you, <laughs> the knowledge comes in through history. You can look at the experience. You can look at everything that's been done and study it and gain that knowledge. That's in a political sense. But see, I'm not that worried about the politics tonight. I'm worried more about the individual and in our faith, you know, and getting to the hearts of people. I've mentioned that in sermons in the past. 
But we need to make sure that we have knowledge. Because if you don't have knowledge, and the reason I even got in this, Isaiah 5 says that's why they're going into captivity. And if this country just, you know, we don't have knowledge and we keep on making these dumb choices and, and electing leaders that, that, that believe in socialism or whatever, anything along those lines, we're going to be taken into bondage. Now, even regardless of the political stance, we're going to be taken into captivity because the people have no knowledge of God and morality and the sins that are being committed. God is not, you know, God doesn't just sit up in heaven and just doesn't care what's going on. He does care. Especially when it's the nation that is bringing, that has been bringing forth the fruits uh, thereof. No other nation in the world is called like the Christian nation as America has attained that title because of so many people that believe in Christ and, 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 that, and, and that you have used this book as their guideline for everything. We have fallen fast from being a Christian nation. And God is going to bring that judgment. We need to have the proper knowledge so that we are not angering God because we fear him. Makes sense. Proverbs 12, 1 says, Whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. Now, when it comes to instruction and learning, if you love instruction, what is instruction? It's being told what to do. Here's the instructions. If you love instruction, you love knowledge. But he that hateth reproof, what's reproof? Being told that you're wrong. If you just can't stand someone telling you, hey, you're wrong. What you're doing is wrong. Hey, the way that you're living is wrong. Hey, what you're doing, that's a sin. If you hate that, if you can't stand to be told what, you know, that what you're doing is wrong, it says, the Bible says you're brutish. And brutish, you know, basically means you're kind of stupid. I mean, to put it, to put it in a modern vernacular today, being brutish means you're being kind of stupid. We ought to love whatever right is, whatever righteousness is, whatever the truth is. If it means that we're wrong, if it means that it exposes some aspect of our life that we are not doing what's right, it's not, all, it's not the most pleasant thing, but we ought to still love that enough to say, you know what, I like that. I want to grow. I want to get past whatever it is I'm doing wrong and keep growing and moving forward and doing what's right. And the wise man will love that. If you love knowledge, you, you'll love to just gain more uh, understanding and knowledge through being told, here's the instructions. And we know what? We have the instructions. I'm not talking about some instructions that are just made up by a person. And again, we talked to a lady out soul winning today that was kind of getting off her chest some of the things that she doesn't like about different churches that she's attended in the past. They, well, they have all these rules and all this other stuff. And I could see what she's saying because a lot of churches, they will like make you sign. Like, if you want to become a member of this church, you have to agree to our rules and all this other stuff. We don't have that here. But you know where the rules should come from and they do come from for this church? It's just in the pages of this book. Whatever God has laid out as the instructions, as the rules, this is what we follow. I'm not going to make up a specific dress code and all this other stuff, even though it may have some kind of biblical backing. I'm not going to make up my own set of instructions and rules for you because we already have a rule book right here. And we're just going to stick to what this book says and what these instructions are. But in order to gain knowledge, we ought to know God's instructions, which means reading your Bible. Church, I believe, is extremely important. I believe it's a sin not to come to church. The Bible talks about in Ephesians that God has given us, you know, pastors and deacons and all of these people for the perfecting of the saints to help make you better. Church is a place that we ought to go. God instituted the local church and put pastors in place to do a certain job. But that job is... Um, it should not take the place of your own instruction and education from God's word. As important as I believe the church is, this is not, should not be the only place where you get any learning or any understanding. We need to be in God's word daily to understand the instructions for yourself because another thing is, you know, people are going to want to teach you all kinds of different people. You might be reading books, you might be on the internet or whatever. You need to make sure you know this book for yourself so that you are not deceived. Because that's going to fall, ultimately that responsibility falls upon you as an individual. God's not going to say, I mean, yeah, he'll punish the false prophet. 
But also, those people that get deceived by the false prophet, you know, you need to make sure that you're, you're knowing what the Word says also. We all are, are responsible for that. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. So the next, the next quality in our list, he says, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, and then to knowledge temperance. So what is temperance? Temperance is being able to control your temper. Temperance is, is really self-control, being able to determine and dictate what you're going to do because you are in charge, you're in control, you don't fly off the handle, right? You're not easily provoked, you're not, you're not someone who's just, just on a whim or if it feels good, do it and just let your body kind of lead with whatever you're going to do. You are in charge and you are the one making the decisions. That is having temperance, being able to restrain yourselves. Being able to withhold, not being impulsive. That is having temperance. And the Bible says if you don't have temperance, it's part of this list, if it's not in you and abound, you're blind. And that's going to prevent you from being fruitful. Now, what are some examples? Of this? I could think of, you know, let's start with children. Children, listen up. Sit down in your chair and listen up. You need to be able to control yourself. That's what having temperance means. So when your parents tell you to do something, you need to be able to do it and do what your parents say without talking back to them. You may feel like you want to explain yourself. And I know my kids do this all the time. Like, no, but dad, you don't understand. I gotta, you know. Being able to control all of those explanations when you already know dad doesn't want to hear that right now. Dad wants me to say, yes, sir, and go and do what I'm being told to do. Temperance means you could control your urge to, to justify yourself and do what dad wants you to do. That's just one small example. You can think of, um, and, and with wives, right? Oftentimes, you could, you could have a disagreement in the home between a husband and a wife, but God has ordained that the, the husband is the head of the household. And that he is the one ultimately in charge of making the decisions for the family. And as a wife, you may disagree with that decision. You may not think that that's right. A wife without temperance will just start saying a lot more things and, you know, and, and making things push a little bit farther than it needs to go instead of just being able to fall back into your role that God has ordained and say, you know what, my husband made this decision and I totally don't agree with it, but I am going to show some temperance and, and not you know, maybe speak really disrespectfully to my husband. And I'm not saying that a woman just always has to be silent and never voice any concern. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But oftentimes, and you know this if you're married, you, you, get into the, you can get into these, these fights or disagreements where all of a sudden it, it gets, it get blows up and it gets a lot worse than it needs to be. And it's usually because, and this could happen on both ends, someone not being able to show restraint. You know, we ought to be careful with the things that we say. The Bible talks in the, in the book of James about the tongue being a, 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 you know, a fire, a world of iniquity, and that you know, he that bridleth his tongue can bridle his whole body. The things that come out of your mouth, you can't take those things back. So when you get involved in, in, in a heated discussion or an argument, you know, be careful, have the temperance to control what you're saying. And even dads, be careful with what you're saying because we ought to be men of our word. So when your kids do something, you might make you really upset. Your kids or your wife, whatever, be careful with what you say. You say, you know what? Because of that, now I'm saying thus and so. Now, you are not going to do this for however long. You, know, you have to stick to that now, and you ought to stick to that. But be careful with what you're saying, because it may not be exactly what, appropriate what you want to do. And even, with, you know, with, when, especially with a name calling, I don't care who you are. You know, if you love someone, you ought not to be calling them names. You know, husbands or wives or children, you know, like, like there's never a need to be just using bad language or, or calling someone names or, or, or just tearing them down. You can be the husband and, and be in charge and set things the way that they need to be said without being nasty about it, ever. 
And wives, same thing. You could be submissive, you ought to be submissive, but, but you don't have to be nasty with your husband when you disagree with him. Temperance will help you to control that. And that's more than just even, you know, that's, that, these are some examples with the words that we speak, with language. It's real easy to do that and get caught up in that. But temperance can say, you know what, I'm going to control myself. I'm not going to respond. I'm not going to respond the way that I'm thinking right now in my head. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold back, right? But temperance also comes into play with all kinds of lusts of the flesh. I mean, you could think of eating or drinking. I mean, people have a problem with overeating and just indulge. And, and oftentimes, you know, people have a problem with uh, when they get depressed, comforting, oh, I'm just going to eat a, a tub of ice cream or whatever, and just overindulging in things. We need to be able to, to, to show temperance and say, you know what? No, I am controlling my body, right? I am not going to let myself do this. And I mean, whatever, you apply it to, to smoking or drinking or anything, showing the temperance to be able, the ability to say, I'm in charge and I'm not going to do this because I'm going to do what's right. Add to temperance, the Bible says, patience. So here's the next attribute. You're in Hebrews 10, right? I'll read for you from Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, 3 says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience, experience, and experience, hope. Now, I touched on this briefly this morning about, you know, this morning's sermon was about being excited about the resurrection of Christ. And if you're going to live godly, you know, you're going to suffer persecution. You're going to suffer tribulations. And here we're seeing a passage where he says, look, we glory in tribulations. We're happy about it. We're saying, oh, man, I'm getting persecuted. All right. And you say, what in the world? Why would you be happy about it? But he says, look, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. When you face hard times and you're going through it, it's going to help you to be able to not freak out when it comes again. You're going to have more patience and level-headedness and being able to, to deal with problems appropriately. Because um, patience, what is it? You're not, you're not just responding real quick. You're going to be able to, to take it all in. It it's, goes hand in hand again with, with temperance. But you're being patient toward you're, you're able to allow things to play out without overreacting or reacting too soon, you have the patience to handle that. And you should be happy when you get the tribulations and the trials because it works your patience. You're, there, oh, you're really testing my patience right now. You should be happy about that. Don't, make it, don't be angry. You know, kids are testing your patience. Let's glory in that tribulation, right? <laughs> because the tribulation works with patience and patience experience. And the more times it happens, the more, you know, it, it's, it's similar to... Um, I remember our first, when our first daughter was born, you know, we didn't have any experience. It's our first child. We, uh, you gain a lot of knowledge through the experience and through experience. Oh, and by the time we got to the fourth one, it's, oh yeah, we've been there before. You know, it's like you don't worry as much nearly about a lot of things. But it also makes us more patient. Like, oh, okay, yeah, we're used to, we know that this has happened in the past. It's easier to, to start getting freaked out and worried about things with the first, the first birth, the first child being born, because you don't know, you haven't been through any of this before, than it is as you continue to go through them. And a childbirth and labor is tribulation. It's not, it's not like a fun time. You just ask my wife, right, <laughs> how fun it was going through labor and giving birth to our children. It is a time of tribulation. And, but the more you go through it, and, and you know, all that said, just to apply spiritually, you know, when, when attacks come on you, the more it happens, the more you should be able to build on that, and it'll, it'll increase your patience, increase your experience, and your hope, and it won't get you down, and you won't freak out about things as much. The first time things happen, it's, it's harder, but um, we need to add patience. You're in Hebrews 10. Look at verse number 32. Hebrews 10. The Bible reads, But call to remembrance the former days in which, after you were illuminated, Ye endured a great fight of affliction. So he said, after you illuminated, after you knew the truth, after you got saved, ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, 
and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. So what he's saying here, we're we'll getting into the, the next three verses in just a minute. He's saying, remember, call to remembrance the former days. When you first got saved and you went through this great fight of afflictions, all of a sudden, all these problems were coming your way. And he says, partly because you were made a gazing stock by reproaches and afflictions, but also partly because of the companions that also were made a gazing stock, which is, he's talking about himself, right? He's like, you were friends with me, and they, not, not only did they hate you for what you believe, but they hate you because you're buddies with me too. And I, he's, you know, Paul already had a, a bad reputation among the Pharisees and among the, the people who hated God and were trying to shut him down. But he's saying, but look, you had compassion on me and took joyfully the spoiling of... No, who, who wants their goods just to be spoiled? Meaning just, just taken from you. Right? No one wants the spoiling of your own goods. But he says, you know what? You suffered that and you took it joyfully knowing that you have a better, in heaven, a better and an enduring substance. Verse 35, cast not away therefore your confidence which hath great recompense of reward for ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. So the patience here that, he, that he's referring to about having is through your, your Christian walk and your life when afflictions and tribulations come, being able to have that patience so that after you've done what's right, you've done the will of God, he says you might receive the promise. You don't just freak out and stop serving God and just quit and throw up your hands because you, a little trouble came your way. You have the patience to endure and to see it through to the end because you know what the end is going to be like. You know that there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ where you will receive the promise. Turn, if you would, to the book of James. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse number 2 reads, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So again, we're talking about entering into diverse time temptations, trials, being tested, but working the patience in you. And patience is a good quality, it's a good attribute that we need to have. So don't shy away from those tribulations, but take it patiently. Allow yourselves to go through it and to suffer it. Hey, Jesus Christ faced great temptation, right? He went through great tribulation, but what did he do? He took it patiently. When people were mocking him and hitting him and ridiculing him and spitting him on him and, and, and hitting him in the face, did he get angry? Did he get upset? Did he quit? Did he, did he, did he strike back? He took it patiently. Now that requires a lot of temperance, the self-control, and patience to go through the ordeal that he went through, but what he did was right. And we need to make sure that we go through these type of times right and be able to have the patience to endure those temptations. Look at James chapter 5, just a few pages to the right. James chapter 5, verse number 10. James 5.10 reads, Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So he brings up here the patience of Job. Just as I was describing Jesus Christ and the patience he had, think about Job and what he went through and all of his financial loss. He lost all of his goods. He lost all of his children. He lost everything that he had, but what he took it patiently. Naked came out of my mother's belly, naked shall I return, you know. Naked came out into this world, naked shall I return thither. He says, the Lord is given, the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He didn't charge God foolishly, he took it patiently. Now he didn't understand what was going on, he didn't get why all of this was happening to him, but he took it patiently. And the Bible says, you know, you know the end of the Lord. Just as Job. And, and think about what happened with the story of Job. What happened? God blessed him double 
everything that was taken away from him. So he did what was right. He maintained his integrity. He patiently endured what he was going through at the time, the hard times. Didn't quit on God. Didn't quit, you know, didn't renounce his faith. Didn't do any of that stuff. And because he took it patiently, he got rewarded greatly at the latter end of his life. And I am sure in heaven also that Job's got a great reward coming to him as being an, a great example of a Christian and someone who doesn't just turn his back on God at even probably the worst thing that we could think of. Imagine that could happen to us today, enduring everything that he had to go through. But in order to maintain your patience, we need to be able to see the end and be able to know that we could make it through these things. 1 Peter chapter 2. Actually, no, I'm going to skip this point. Let's just go on to the next, the next quality. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. I feel like I'm belaboring the point of having patience. Because everyone here is just so impatient. You're like, get on to the next point already. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you guys are doing very well with the patience. Thank you. But unto patience. So what have we gone over so far? We have virtue, right? Add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, temperance. And temperance, patience. And you kind of see how they, how they overlap with each other. And then he says to add to that godliness. Now, what, what I've done in studying and preparing for the sermon, I was trying to find all the dimensions for all of these various things. And there's, there's other mentions. I'm just bringing up a few of them to help us get a good understanding of these attributes so that we could work on whatever. What, now, you may be doing great in many of these areas, but I don't think any of us is perfect. We all could probably stand to work on something, whether it be our patience or our knowledge or, or you know, whatever, the, the virtue, actually doing good things. Not just learning about them, but doing them. He says to add godliness. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse number 9. The Bible reads, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So the Bible is saying here in 1 Timothy 2, now he goes into, you know, he mentions how women should be dressed or how they should not be dressed, right? Saying that this, you know, this is the way that women should be, you know, being modest and everything else. But then he says that they should be clothed not with these fancy outward adornments like the gold and the pearls and, and the, the glittery, you know, glittery stuff and saying, oh, look at me. If a woman is professing godliness, they should adorn themselves with good works. So one of the attributes we have is, is godliness, right? Now, that's pretty broad. You could say, well, just being like God, right? Hey, Christ is our example, right? That's, that's a, good, a good place to get godliness from is looking at the example of Christ. And what did Christ do? A lot of good works. Now, you may not be able to raise the dead or heal the sick, but there's other good works that you could do. Definitely, you could be preaching the gospel as the number one good work that we could be doing. I, I'll stress that uh, until the day I'm, I die, I'm going to be stressing the fact of how important preaching the gospel is. Flip over to chapter 4. You're in 1 Timothy right, uh, chapter 2. Just flip over to chapter 4. Look at verse number 7. So women that, that profess godliness do good works. Verse 7. But refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. So when you're involved in listening to these old wives fables and the profane speakers and these these false prophets that's not godliness he's saying you need to exercise yourself rather unto godliness for bodily exercise profiteth little but godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come now flip over to second timothy chapter two just another page or two over in your bibles We're going to see something very similar. So what you are allowing yourself to receive as far as teaching and, and who you're hanging around with will have an impact on your godliness. We saw in, in 1 Timothy 4, we just read there, refuse profane and old wives' fables because they will lead to ungodliness. Look at verse number 16 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. 
The Bible reads, but shun, that means basically refuse, have nothing to do with profane and vain babblings. What's, what's profane and vain babbling? Now, vain means they're empty, they're meaningless. It's just you know, babble, 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 just talking. It means nothing. It says, shut that out. You don't need that. Why? It says, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So if you want to have a godly attribute, get rid of indulging in this vain and profane babbling. Now, the first thing that comes to mind with me is like the People magazine, right? Following what all these, these actors and actresses are doing because it's empty. It's vanity. Who cares what they do with their life? Why does that matter to you at all? For one, it's vanity, but for two, they're profane. They're adulterers. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're liars. They go out and do these things. That they, they lead a wicked lifestyle. We should be shunning that have nothing to do with that in your life because all that's going to do is rub off on you and lead to more ungodliness. Be careful what we allow into our lives. What, you know, the, the profane and vain babblings. And it doesn't have to be the movie. It could be anything. Just think about what you just allow into your life that's just meaningless and empty and it's just babbling. Just a whole bunch of babbling. I want nothing to do with that because all that's going to do is just lead to more ungodliness. Verse 17, And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. So now Paul is mentioning here, like, look, this is who you need to stay away from because their word is going to eat. Like, it's just going to fester and it's going to, you know, a little leaven is going to leaven the whole lump. Stay away from the vain and profane babblings of Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. This is even more important to watch out for than the People magazine. People magazine is vain and profane. But what he's bringing up as an example here is two people who are preaching bad, false doctrine, which is actually overthrowing the faith of some people because they were saying, well, Resurrection already happened. You know, as in our resurrection. No, it hasn't. There's Jesus Christ was the first fruits. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's what we're celebrating today. But the, the next resurrection is going to happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's when those who are asleep in Christ are going to be raised from the dead. And those of us who are alive and, which, and remain will be caught up together with Him in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We need to watch out for the, for the heretics and the false prophets out there that have these profane and vain babblings that go against the, the sound uh, doctrine of the Bible that are overthrowing the faith of some. Flip over, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. Go backwards see, to Ephesians chapter 4. So with godliness, we, we really need to make sure what, we're, what is coming into our life so that it doesn't make us ungodly. And being godly is going to be following the example of Jesus Christ and doing those things that he set forth as, as the way that, that we need to be living our life, to have that godliness. And again, that's tied in with works, as virtue is, doing good things. So we add to our godliness brotherly kindness. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 30. Ephesians 4, verse 30 reads, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Brotherly kindness. Now, we ought to be kind to our brothers and sisters in Christ, no doubt. But even to people who are not our brothers and sisters, we need to have that type of a brotherly kindness. You know, the, the, the brotherly is an adjective to the kindness. What type of kindness should we have? A brotherly kindness. Think about how... It, in at least a functional family, I'm not talking about dysfunctional families, when you have a brother, right how you treat each other and you're kind to another and, and that you would do things for your brother, right? Having that type of a brotherly kindness is what he's saying that we ought to have. Um, in Ephesians 4 here, he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. You're saved. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. How would you grieve it? That's why he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger, 
So we ought not to be bitter against people because if, if you're bitter against someone, you're going to be grieving that Holy Spirit. If you have wrath, you know, hey, God has wrath. We don't need to have wrath. God is the judge. God's going to make sure things are taken care of. We don't need to have that wrath towards other people. We ought to be able to just serve God in patience and endure and be able to, to get through everything um, and leave, leave the, the problems to God. And anger, you know, we don't need to be getting angry. It says, and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind one to another. Kind is the opposite of all of those things. Um, I'm sure all of you know that already, but just reinforcing that here. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You know, and that, the, the forgiveness comes in with the bitterness. You know, being, being angry and bitter towards someone else, we ought rather to be able to forgive them. That's having brotherly kindness. And then the last thing, which is, which is very much related to brotherly kindness, is charity. Turn, if you would, to uh, Colossians. Well, you're in Ephesians. Yeah, turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3, if you're in Ephesians. You got Philippians and then Colossians to the right. Colossians chapter 3. The last attribute that he mentions for not being a blind Christian is having charity. And charity in many places of the Bible, we'll see a couple of them, is kind of like, like the last step. Now, these are all things that we need to be working on continually, but be, having charity is kind of um, completing your, your, your Christian attributes. Colossians chapter 3, look at verse number 12. The Bible says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, right? So we saw brotherly kindness already. Bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. This is the type of attitude that we need to have. That we can be uh, forgiving to people who have done us wrong. And above all these things, above all, think about how important it is to be able to have forgiveness, and meekness and hum humility, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. He says, above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Now, we're going to get way more in depth on charity in our 1 Corinthians chapter 13, two weeks from Wednesday. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I don't even have any references there tonight because that entire chapter is about charity. And I strongly urge you to read that chapter, to, to memorize it. Definitely read it. If you're coming to be here on a Wednesday night, read it before we study it and, and get to know that chapter. Look at how important charity is. Charity is the last thing mentioned in this list. It's also the last thing mentioned in Colossians chapter 3. Say, look, you need to be humble. You need to be forgiving. But above all of that, have charity. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. Be the last place I have you turn tonight. Just 1 Timothy chapter 1. I'll read for you 1 first, first Peter 4 8 says, And above all things, above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Charity is an extremely important attribute, and that's probably something, an area where we can all be working on as, as a whole, since that is the bond of perfectness. Right? That is the, the completing of, of the, the Christian attributes. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. The end. What's the end of the commandment? It's the, result. It's, it's the whole point of the commandment. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Not a fake faith, but a real, genuine faith. From which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. You know, people get distracted from the truth and, and from the, the, the real faith unto this vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. So what is charity? We'll go, like I said, we'll go into that a lot more. But just real basically, the, you know, charity is a type of love where you are esteeming someone better than yourself. You know, people often think that charity is just, well, I gave money to charity. 1 Corinthians 13 describes that you can give all of your money to the poor and still not have charity. The action of just giving money is not in and of itself even considered in biblical terms charity. Charity is a love that you have in your heart towards other people. 
Charity is, is that, that great love that, that puts, like I said, puts other people before you to where you are just way more interested in someone else succeeding than yourself, whatever that may take. If it takes some money, providing money for them, okay, then that's what they need, helping them out in that way. If it takes other things, it could even take reproof or rebuke, any of these things where you are so concerned about helping other people out, that is charity. Charity is going out and, and telling the lost that they need a savior. That also is charitable. It's expressing and doing and putting yourself forth to provide that love for someone that you don't even know. You've never even met before, but just saying, you know what? You need, you need to hear this, and I'm gonna, I, I esteem you better right now because I could be doing all kinds of other things with my time, but I'm here to show you what the Bible says so that you can be saved because God loves you. And that is having a charitable heart. And... We don't want to be blind Christians, which, and, and I don't think there's anyone here that, that necessarily could be considered blind, but he says if we have all of these things, if we have virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness, brotherly kindness and charity, there is no way you're going to be unfruitful. So if you are unfruitful today, think about all these things and say, you know what, what am I lacking? Where am I lacking? I want to be fruitful. I want to bring forth fruit unto Christ. Where am I lacking? Because something has to be if you're not. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great instruction that you've given us, dear Lord. I pray that some of the words that were spoken tonight and a lot of the verses that we read, dear Lord, will have an impact on somebody's life tonight and on somebody here that needs to... Uh, address whatever personal issues they have to get more right and in tune. And dear God, myself included, dear Lord, I know that, that I can be more charitable and I pray that you would please help me to, to do that also. And um, Lord, help us to have the mindset that Christ had. Because Christ didn't come to, to be served. He came as a servant, dear Lord. And we know that and we appreciate that. And we pray that you would please help us to have that same type of a mindset to be able to go out and, and help others the way that Christ came to help the world, dear Lord, and to bring them unto him. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.